So um, thanks, Chris, and, and uh, thanks everyone for for joining. Um, Chris Van Sant, just you know, very quickly, um, and we'll get into more of his background during during the interview. But um, he's a career special forces veteran. Uh, you know, spent roughly twenty years in the army. Um, uh, and uh, Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, was roughly ten of that or so in, in Delta Force. Um, I forget the exact uh, uh, tenure right. there, but. Um, suffice to say, he's uh, he's seen a lot. Um, you know, he was part of the team that captured Saddam Hussein and the sort of deck of cards uh, below Saddam, um, including, I think, his sons. Um, and he's been on nearly 600 combat missions through his career. Truly tip of the spear. It's, it, Chris, it's, 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 it's an honor, um, you know, to have you on. And uh, I've, I've listened to a bunch of your interviews um, just with, you know, on other podcasts and whatnot. And I think... What, what struck me as kind of different about you is you don't come across as the prototypical kind of uh, uber aggro warrior type. Um, you know, you, you kind of struck me as maybe, um, uh, you know, having a little bit more of a, an introspective, softer side, maybe a little bit more intellectual um, and uh, anyway, I, 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 I just think it's interesting that you've kind of You've, you've got obviously uh, there's another training toolkit that comes with that, but it's clear to me that you've thought a lot about your craft and um, you know, and also kind of um, uh, the after effects of war and, and sort of um, all that as well. So, and 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 of course, for for folks who are listening, Chris is now the CEO COO of the All Secure Foundation, which is focused on helping veterans uh, or special forces veterans with um, mental health issues and, and trauma related issues um, from, from their, their combat experiences. So <clears throat> with that, Chris, um, we can start off with something really silly and then we'll get into your, uh, your background, but nine uh, millimeter versus 45 ACP. What's your, <laughs> what's your caliber of choice? Uh, I, I grew up and learned on a 45, um, a full framed 45 caliber handgun is, is a great tool. Uh, lots of stopping power, um, very accurate and effective. Uh, most organizations have shifted to nine millimeter these days. Um, you can carry more ammunition. Uh, it's a little easier weapon to handle, but yeah, I'm always going to, I'm always going to be in the 45 camp. Old school. Love it. Um, Awesome. So let's start with uh, just quickly on your background. You know, how did you um, like what attracted you to the military? What was this kind of um, a career that you always wanted or did you fall into it? Like what what drove you to the military in the first place? Yeah, no. Um, grew up in a small town, grew up in Dover, Delaware. Um, I had um, both my grandfathers on my mother's side and father's side both served in World War II. Uh, and I think there was a myriad of things that drew me to the military. I, you know, I wanted the challenge. I wanted to do something different, maybe a little bit of adventure. Uh, I also was a little bit of a wild child growing up. So I, I knew, um, I think I had this, the self wherewithal to know I needed a little bit of structure and the military could provide that. Um, but, but to be honest, the, the big thing was listening to, to my mom's father, to my grandfather on my mom's side. Um, I was the, the youngest of all the grandchildren. And so consequently, you know, most World War II vets don't talk about their experiences, but I got my grandfather um, at a point when he was, you know, far enough along in life that he started to share some of those stories. And because I was the youngest grandkid, I was around um, the most when that time happened. And I got to listen to him kind of share with me a lot of the good and a lot of the bad. But I, I think the way I phrase it to people is he always he always spoke about it with such reverence. Like he was so proud of his time in the service. He spent four years away during World War II. So almost all of his military experience was in combat. So that was sort of my frame of reference. Um, and I think that kind of planted the seed and it grew and grew. So it was very appealing to me when, when I was of age and, and could join the military myself. So did you ever think about if you were not going to join the military, what you like, what was the backup or did that? Yeah. That it yeah. I mean, I was, I was, a, I was an athlete in high school, um, baseball pride probably being my predominant sport. My father was a college baseball coach and a big baseball guy. I was kind of raised on baseball. So, um, yeah, I, I think 
early on in high school, my plan was to go on and play college ball somewhere and, and go to university somewhere. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I think as the years went by, I realized, uh, if I'm candid, I realized I probably wasn't going to do great my first few years in college um, because I like to have a good time a little too much. And I was worried it was going to affect my baseball career as well. Um, so I decided to press pause and join the military. That's interesting. Um, so, you know, one of the things that um, I think is a, is a parallel between kind of what, what you did in your military career and, and, and probably your ethos overall and what a lot of folks on this call and, and folks within the Sun Zero community, um, you know, think about on a day-to-day -day basis with respect to their jobs is, you know, kind of like training and, and, and kind of honing their, their skill set. Now for investors, like that's understanding kind of financial uh, basics. Obviously there's, there's kind of finance 101, but there's a lot of psychology that also impacts investing and, you know, the, the more experience you have, the more you kind of have to self-reflect on like what's worked, what hasn't worked and all of that. But I'd love to kind of just understand um, kind of your path uh, from a training standpoint um, to Delta, you know, if that's sort of the, the Holy Grail, like how, do you, how did you get there? What was the, what were the sort of sacrifices you had to make? Um, and just, just what was it like being tested through, like for all those years <laughs> to even get there. And then once you're there, obviously, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's no time to relax. Um, but if you can just talk through that, starting out in the military and, and the path forward. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, started out as a young kid. Um, if there's one thing the army does well is the army breeds leaders. So you start out kind of at the bottom and, and as you progress um, and you're exposed to more things and you grow in experience and understanding of, how things work in military operations, then slowly but surely you're you're sort of placed in leadership roles first and, you know, in a small team scenario where you just have a couple of folks working for you and then up to a squad where you've got eight or 10, uh, eventually a platoon, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think there's there's lots of gates along the way that that really help you understand um you know, that how to provide purpose, direction and motivation to, to folks around you. Um, and then I think in order to do that effectively, you've got to be a very self-motivated, a very self-driven individual um, of your own accord. Uh, I think progressing through the military, um, you know, to get into special operations, I think a lot more is asked of you, um, both as an individual and as a leader. Uh, I think the, the unit that I ended up in in particular does a, an amazing job of of screening, assessing, and selecting folks, um, not just on your physical abilities, but on, on you know, your IQ, um, your psychological makeup, uh, sort of the things that give you drive when there are no other factors other than yourself. Um, I think, I think athletics as a young child played a lot into, into my success. I think I was competitive from a very early age because of athletics. Um, and I think that bled into pretty much everything else in my life where, you know, you always want to want to strive to do your best. You want to finish at the top of the pack and you want to beat the, the man or the woman next to you um, at any opportunity that you get. Uh, and I think I was very much like that. So um, for me, you know, it was, again, to make another athletics reference, I never just wanted to be a, a regular person. I always wanted to achieve the highest level that I could. And I was always driven to get there. So the military is, is um, I wouldn't call it unique, but there are there are a lot of different avenues to excel. Um, special operations sort of being at the pointy end of the spear there. Um, so I think from a very early on in my career, I started out in the 75th Ranger Regiment, and there were quite a few gates just to get to that. Um, you know, basic training and airborne school, and then the Ranger indoctrination program. You were always asked to to perform mentally and physically to kind of get through that next gate. But yeah, I think. I think my whole path sort of prepared me for when I eventually decided to go to the, to the unit. And just, just for, for folks who maybe aren't in, in your sphere as much, uh, Delta is the unit or the unit is Delta. But when you were, um, when you were in the Ranger Regiment and um, like, did you know about Delta or how did you even hear about it? Were you invited? Um, what was that initial? Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, entree there was, there was a Chuck Norris Lee Marvin movie in the in the 80s called The Delta Force. Um, that was 
about all I knew coming into the military. I knew I'd done a lot of reading about the various operations. You heard about it. it was, yeah. And you, then you literally heard about it through Hollywood. I did. Yeah. Through Hollywood. And then when I got into the Ranger Regiment, um, so back then in the 90s, the Ranger Regiment used to do things to support the Delta Force. So Delta Force might have a specific mission and Ranger Regiment did things on the periphery of that, whether it was outer security or cordon and search or whatever it was, but they worked in conjunction with, but you hardly ever saw them. So my only interaction or my first interactions with them were as a young Ranger, we would jump in on a, we would parachute into an airfield, secure that airfield, and then on one end of that airfield, there might be a set of buildings that was that was the unit's target. Uh, and we would be sitting out there in the middle of this drop zone and hear helicopters come in under the cover of, of, of night and guys would get out. They would you'd hear a bunch of, you know, flashbangs and gunfire. And then the helicopters would come back five or 10 minutes later and then they would fly away. Um, so they were sort of uh, to me as a young ranger, they were sort of these like mythical superheroes that did things that I could only dream of doing. But yeah, so there's a lot of lore, I think, there in the early years uh, to want to get to that level. So so you're 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 a ranger and you have watched the movie <laughs> and you've seen you've seen these ghosts kind of uh, hit targets and then fly away. Um now, so like with with the with respect to to, to applying or, or going through selection for the unit, um, like what was that like? I mean, I don't know how much you can say about this, but like what what differentiated that process from maybe your your prior military experiences in terms of just the level and the standard? Yeah, um, well, it was much more thorough. Um, there's a, you know, there's a set of gates that you have to meet minimum time in service. Uh, there's an age requirement. So you have to be a minimum age. You have to score a certain amount on your physical training fitness exam. Um, you have to do a, an 18 mile road march in a certain period of time. Um, you have to take a psychological evaluation one-on-one -on -one with, with a military psychiatrist. Uh, and you have to take a fairly thorough um, um, IQ test. Uh, and so, yeah, you kind of do all of those things um, in your application process. And then that information is weeded through. And then they make the determination based on all of that information, plus your military background and experience, if they want to give you a chance to come try out. Um, I was fortunate and I was afforded that opportunity um, selection is, um, an individual event, uh, when it comes to the Delta force, um, much different than a lot of other special operations in that you, there's quite a bit of team assessment and your teamwork is, in, is assessed. Uh, the unit is very particular about assessing you as an individual and your individual performance and motivation. Uh, and I think the idea is, um, you know, because of their minimum requirements, the army has trained you to be a part of a team from, from 18 years old until when you get there. Um, but they, they really haven't pushed you to this level as an individual and they want to see, you know, where, where you stand, what, what, where, what your ability to motivate yourself is when no one else is telling you to do it. Um, I will tell you that unit selection was probably the most professional run course I've ever been a part of. Um, your instructions that you receive daily are very specific. Uh, you're told exactly where to be, what to bring, and, and what's expected of you throughout the course of that day. Um, but it's all open-ended in that you don't know when your day is going to end. And I think that's where a lot of the mental challenge comes in is how hard do I push myself? Is this going to be the last thing that I do today? Do I need to keep some in the tank in case there's something else? Um, I think it's being able to individually assess how far and how fast you can push yourself and still have enough left in the tank to keep going if you're asked to do so. So for me, it was a very unique experience. I actually failed. I was unsuccessful my first time through selection, um, but I was fortunate in that they asked me um, to come back. They, they told me that I was able to return and assess again if I would like to. Um, and that was about all the mo motivation I needed to try it a second time was I must have done well enough for them to think, I actually have a shot of getting through this. Um, and so I waited about a year and I went and did it again and, uh, and fortunately was successful. 
and then uh, moved on into training, which is really just the next level of assessment and selection. Uh, and then to your earlier point, I think I think the thing that surprised me most probably, like I said, I was thinking about these as, as superhuman individuals. Um, the thing that surprised me most about the training pipeline was that we went back to the basics, was that we started basically from zero um, with things like basic rifle marksmanship, and they literally taught you how to shoot from square one uh, all the way through, you know, advanced and very complex uh, close quarter battle drills as a part of a team. So, um, yeah, being a master of the basics uh, is absolutely part of the mantra of being part of of extremely professional and, and well put together organizations. So sometimes when you you put a, a person or a group on a pedestal um, for a long time, you know, then you meet that person or you meet that team and you're like, oh, like, like this isn't that, you know, maybe it's sort of like the emperor with no clothes syndrome, whatever. But like when you finally were there and you're, you know, you're with these guys, what did that feel like? Were you like, did they meet your expectations? Exceed, not meet expectations? Uh, like what was that, you know, kind of meeting these superheroes as you call them, like, and now you're one, you're kind of with them. Like, what was that like for you? Yeah, I think the first one was my first realization was like, I'm not a, I'm not a physically impressive guy. Like I take good care of myself and I'm in good shape, but, but I was, I was a skinny little dude when I got there. Um, and I think my first impression was these guys aren't all built like Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, like the, the majority of them, um, are, are very fit sort of average normal individuals uh so there are some guys that are physical beasts and and then there's some little tiny guys but the majority of them are you know built like runners um so that was kind of my first realization the second one on the on the uh, are they superhero level is you come out of school um better trained than you have ever been um to use close quarters battle as an example you know you come out of training thinking wow i'm so fast and so good at this and so accurate uh, and then the first time that you do something with a team, you are immediately humbled that these guys that have been doing this for years and doing it together for years are incredibly fast, incredibly proficient and have the capacity to be incredibly deadly whenever they need to be. And, and that is an eye opener of, you know, I, I'm not just here now and I'm done. I'm going to have to continue to work every day to be the best that I can to continue to be a part of this organization. So it was a little bit of both. Um, but, uh, but yeah, like you all in all, all, in all, all I think I'm just, I, I think I was, I was overly impressed. Uh, and then I think the things that were surprising were good surprises were that, were that, yeah, you can't judge a book by its cover. You could look at a guy on the street and think nothing of him, and, and he might be one of the best trained deadliest people on the planet. So you really have to be aware of those things. <laughs> but it, it's, did you feel average all of a sudden? Uh, I think uh, average to bottom of average. I think going through training, um, you know, everything that you do is assessed, your, your shooting performance, your physical performance. And I think finishing in the middle of the pack was always my goal. Uh, I, I, you know, I knew there were guys that were a lot better than me that were always going to be at the top. I just wanted to be better than the guys that were at the bottom of the pack. Um, so, so yeah, I think striving every day to be average in an organization that's high performing um, is a pretty good goal. Yeah. Um, so uh, you made it through training. Now suddenly you're, I guess, on deployment or you know, you're, 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 you're sort of in combat. Um, can you talk through kind of like maybe some of the emotional, like the fear aspects of like, you're not, you're not in a, in a, you know, in an artificially constructed kill house anymore, but you're, you're in Iraq, you're in Africa and like somebody's asking you to go clear a room, you know, or somebody might shoot back. Um, there's obviously some degree of uncertainty and, and, and fear maybe associated with that uncertainty. And so for the, the first time were you like, were you really in danger? Like what kicked in in your head? I mean, obviously there's training and all that, but what was that like for you? Uh, yeah. I mean, I was the, as they say, I was the, the nine 11, um, selection class. So, 
9-11 happened. I went to selection right after that uh, and then went through training. So as soon as I completed training, um, my my team was actually deployed overseas to Afghanistan. So the first time I met my team was actually in combat in Afghanistan. I flew over and met them over there. Um, so very quickly, I found myself on combat operations. Uh, what, what Was there fear there? Absolutely. I think I, I was nervous. Um, you don't know what you're going to get. I think I had a lot of confidence in my training and my skill set and felt like I was appropriately prepared for the position that I was about to be put in. Um, but then I think the thing that made the real difference was, was the confidence and the professionalism of the people around me. Um, my teammates were very calm, cool, and collected. I think the first combat operation I ever conducted, the thing that surprised me most was, uh, you know, you have, you have a headset on, so you hear communications over the radios, both between teams and then from your headquarters to your higher headquarters uh, or whatever other, you know, aerial assets and things that are connected to the operation. But one of the things that stood out most for me was just the cool, calm, collected nature with which one of my leaders spoke on the radio in the midst of a combat operation. It didn't matter what was going on. Um, it was the same even, even keeled level tone that just honestly exuded confidence. Um, and I think if, if I had some fear and some, some reservations early on, I think the combination of all of those things um, just really, really gave me a strong faith in the people around me and the training of all those people that that you know what i'm going to be placed in some uncomfortable situations but i'm surrounded by the best in the world and if anybody's going to get through this we are um there's another unit guy who's uh who described you know going into a gunfight as like just sort of a rush and like he sort of described being around a whole team of guys who would literally like go to the sounds of the gunfire, like with like run towards it, not just kind of walk towards it. Um, which is obviously a little counterintuitive for like, if I was, if I heard gunfire, like I probably would not run towards the gunfire. <laughs> that was, you know, in my, in my town or something like that. But was that part of kind of the, the sort of, uh, you know, overcoming the fear and, and just, the, you know, acquiring the confidence you needed to do your job, like just being around, all these people who are kind of, you know, in it to win it and, and, um, you know, not, not, not looking to shy away from that danger element. Yeah. There's, you know, there's an adrenaline cycle that comes with combat, um, that it's very hard to replicate. Um, that rush of endorphins that you get from being in a, in a life and death scenario and then successfully coming out on the end or other end of it, there, there's not a lot of things in life that, that equal that feeling. Um, so it's very addictive. So yeah, once, once you get over the hump, I think, I think that that motivation of the individuals around you that have been there doing that kind of pulls you into that first engagement. Um, and then, you know, you build confidence, um, kind of with each one where it just gets easier and more comfortable. Uh, and you know, that, that adrenaline spike, that's the body's natural, you know, endorphin rush to help you be more effective in those life and death scenarios. And it becomes very addictive. Um, and it, it also like looking back, like we know now that, that living a peak and valley experience like that at, at those high extremes for a long period of time can also have a lot of detrimental effects on, on you both mentally and physically over the yeah. years. But yeah, early on, absolutely. So so, so can you, I mean, kind of related to that, can you speak to the cadence of your missions? Because like, were you going out on multiple hits in a, in a single night or was it one per night? Like what was the, yeah, just uh, how often were you out? And, and, and it relates to, um, I think some of your personal issues with respect to injuries, but also like insomnia and just not really being able to sleep. I'm, I'm just curious how that like the intensity of what they were, you know, what, what America was asking from you, like was really like. Yeah. It, it, it varied at various stages of conflict. Right. So um, my first trip to Afghanistan, I, I think we did like six missions. It, they were, there's a lot of downtime. There's a lot of boredom. You absolutely look forward to the next thing. Um, and then, you know, I came back from Afghanistan. My next deployment was was the invasion of Iraq. Um, completely different experience where you are on 24-7 because we were driving across 
you know, the desert in a hostile country and, and pursuing targets, you know, nightly or every other day, but, but you had to pretty much maintain that constant state of vigilance. Um, and then you progress into, you know, rotations to Iraq after that, where we were chasing deck of cards or later on when we were ta- chasing, you know, terrorists and then terror network around the country. Um, yeah, there were, there were stretches where, we went months where we were doing 24 hour operations. So you might do a combat assault in the afternoon. You might come home and catch a few hour nap and then be back out at two o'clock in the morning to conduct another one. Um, you know, the predominance of operations, at least on the special operations side are conducted under cover of darkness at night um, because we have the ability to be more effective in the dark than, than most of our enemies because of the technology that's on our side. Um, so yeah, definitely throws your system out of whack. Um, but, but yeah, in terms of operational tempo, uh, I think the peak for me was, was probably early on, like, um, 2003, 2004, um, where we were doing the most things. Um, but the enemy was a little easier back then, you know, when it was Iraqi army folks, um, we were a bit much for them. So we had a lot of guys, you know, there's a lot of targets where you don't have a shot fired. Then you progress into 2005, 2006, when you've got foreign fighters from all over the globe coming into Iraq. Um, and, and maybe we're only prosecuting a target, you know, every once every 24 or every 48 hours or so. Um, but your enemy is a lot better trained, a lot more violent, and you're getting in in high stress, you know, gunfight scenarios a lot more often. So it's just it's kind of the evolution of war. The longer you stay there, it kind of has peaks and valleys. Um, and my career was certainly like that. Yeah, sounds intense. Um, so, um, like, I, I don't know if there's one or more than one examples where you were on a mission where, you know, y- you you sort of feel like you really barely made it out. <laughs> but, uh, I, I, you know, I'm just curious, like, what, what would you say is the most dangerous situation you've been in that that you can talk about? Um, you know, where, where maybe things didn't go as planned. Um, yeah. You found yourself revising and just in, in a really dicey spot. Uh, we had a lot. Um, or I personally have had enough, <laughs> more than my fair share of, of, man, I don't know how I lived through that experiences. Um, I think the ones that stand out to me weren't necessarily just individual where something happened and I'm like, Oh my God, I don't know how I didn't take a, take a bullet there or, or whatever. I think it was more the, the collective where there was the capacity to lose a lot of people in a significant, in a single scenario. Um, and one of, one of them probably a little later on in the Iraq war, I want to say it was Oh, six timeframe. We were, um, we were in helicopters and in, in Black Hawk helicopters, um, basically a whole troop. So 18, 25 guys or so uh, split between various helicopter platforms. And what was supposed to be an assault on a on a vehicle with just a couple of people in a vehicle, um, the vehicle, as we were in pursuit, ended up going to a farmhouse, uh, multiple structures. And there were quite a few other individuals there. Um, and we, because they stopped, (laughs) we ended up flying by the target house, like right over top of it very slowly on accident. And I was screaming at the pilots and crew chiefs on the helicopter that this is the house, this is the house. And so they ended up turning around and flaring and landing in the field next to it. Um, and what turned into a pretty substantial gunfight with a number of terrorists that, uh, we're all wearing body bomb vests, which was fairly common in, in 05, 06, 07. Um, but after we had dealt with with the various individuals and the target was all secure, we discovered that in the courtyard of the house, that basically we flew right over top of and landed right next to were two huge vehicle vehicle born IEDs. So they had two minivans basically that were full of explosives that they had intended on driving into checkpoints or whatever and detonating. Um, and had they, uh, had they clacked either one of those off as we came into the target, it would have taken down at a minimum of two helicopters and, and an entire troop of us special operators. So I think those are the ones that stand out to me 
like like wow we were <laughs> we're good but we were we were lucky that day that that we didn't lose a lot of guys was capturing Saddam anything special in your eyes or was it sort of just another yeah uh, like another hit yeah no i understand the question certainly special I, when you're I think like anybody, when you when you're tasked to to accomplish a mission and you accomplish that mission as hard as difficult and as long as that one took us, you know, it took us almost nine months to find that guy and track him down. Um, so it it was significant um, understanding and, and actually seeing and witnessing and hearing um, all the atrocities that that man was responsible for. Yeah, it was a it was a good feeling to complete that task and and to remove that individual. Hindsight being 2020, you know, people look back on the Iraq war and there's varying opinions and and they are what they are, right, wrong and indifferent. You know, at the end of the day, when you're a U.S. soldier, you're an extension of U.S. foreign policy. And we're lucky that we have people that still volunteer to this day to go do, you know, what our country asked them to do. And we felt like we did it to the best of our ability. So so, yeah, I, I mean, it was it's significant to me. It was significant to us as an organization. Um, that it was it was a mission accomplishment. We were asked to to go get that guy, and we did, um, and we did it successfully. Yeah. Did uh, did, uh, did did McChrystal say anything to you, or did Saddam say anything to you? No, I mean Saddam uh, when he was captured. So it, we hit multiple targets that evening. Um, but when he was captured, he actually said, "I'm Saddam Hussein, the leader of Iraq, and I'm ready to negotiate." <laughs> <laughs> of course, was after he was captured um, but uh yeah and then once we flew him back to 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 um to crit we we had a, a base where we stayed in to crit in the house that we used um and we brought him back there for a few hours before he was flown to baghdad international and put in his detention facility but when we had him in, in to crit there, the leadership there, we took a moment where when we were going to walk him out to the helicopter, we allowed everybody that was a part of the mission to sort of congregate in this little hall of the building we were in um, so that everybody, you know, at any level that was a part of that operation got a chance to see him face to face um, before we flew him off. And that was sort of the end of it. So it was, this, it was a significant moment. Um, I think it was a really cool thing that the leadership chose to do at that time um and then i think most significantly saddam you know before he was walked out he kind of knew what was about to happen um and he was you know disheveled dirty old man that had been hiding for months and months and months but he actually took the time to like prepare himself before he walked out um and i, I just found that interesting that you know his his personal respect for himself and being a leader of that country for that many years, he felt like he needed to compose himself before he was presented to the public. Uh, and I, that just always stood out to me, but yeah, that, that night was, was, um, was pretty neat. Um, and so I was asking about general McChrystal cause I, I know he was oh, yeah. like a big part of the, yeah. Yeah. Did, did, did you know him at all? Uh, I, well, I, I mean, do. What was your relationship with him? Yeah, I do know him. Um, I did. He didn't say anything to us specifically um, then. Uh, General McChrystal is unique in that he's one of those people that remembers everything. Um, he his his ability to track multiple things going on in the world at one time and remember exactly who are the specific individuals involved with each of those operations is like nothing I've ever seen. So. Uh, if I have a unique Stanley McChrystal moment, it was years later um, in 2008. Um, I was working out of the embassy, U.S. Embassy in Nairobi, Kenya, um, and General McChrystal came in for a visit. And I had been involved in an operation a year prior in East Africa in 2007. And he walked in the door, looked me in the eye and said, Chris, we've never had a chance to sit down and talk about last year's mission Let's do that. And he like by name, remember, like, and I, I just, you think of the thousands of people in his charge. I always just found it really impressive that his, his ability to retain that level of information with that much going on around the globe. That's great to hear because a lot of times the folks, <clears throat> you know, within leadership positions, um, 
get so distanced from the folks on the ground that, that the folks on the ground don't relate to them at all and and maybe don't um you know maybe, maybe that that leader doesn't garner the respect that he would otherwise um but it sounds like with mccrystal at least um there was something special about his capabilities that 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 not all generals may have had i mean i when you hear some of these guys talk, you can tell like some of them are immediately impressive for their intellect. And like, you can tell their wheels are turning and others less so, but um, I mean, he's, he's widely credited for being kind of the architect behind uh, the capture. So I think it's, it's, it's cool that you've, you've had positive experiences with them. Um, would you say like, like who are your heroes through those years in combat um, in terms of guys who like, made you want to up your own game and just folks who exhibited like the utmost excellence in, in that yeah. field. Yeah. There were some, a lot. But... I mean, I, I had a lot in my own organization, you know, guys that I looked up to, you know, there, there were, it's interesting. The, the, the generation of guys that were at the point in their career where they were instructors when I was coming into the organization, guys like, like Tom Satterley, who I work for at the all secure foundation, Tom wrote a book of the same name called all secure, but you know, that generation of guys were, were in, some of them were in Panama in 89 or, or even further back somewhere in Grenada in 83, Panama in 89, maybe they did the first Gulf war. But but from the unit side, guys like Tom were involved in, in the Black Hawk down, down incident in 1993 in Somalia. And that was one of the more significant engagements that have ever happened in U.S. history, just in terms of volume in a 24 hour period and, and, and loss and, and facing, you know, vast numbers of enemy combatants. Well, those guys, that generation of guys were all my instructors when I was coming into the unit. Um, and I think there was a, you know, we looked up to them. Yeah. We looked up to them because... They went through one of the toughest things possible a decade before we even showed up um, and we're still at it, you know, as we were progressing into into these new wars all these years later. So I had no shortage of folks to look up to. Um, there was a lot of wisdom in the organization. Um, and yeah, I mean, when you have that level of competency and effectiveness around you, it's pretty easy. You just kind of look you can look to the man next to you if you need a little extra motivation um, because they're all impressive in their yeah. own right. Can you speak to guys um, or, or teammates that that you you had lost that really impacted you in a way that maybe like even you wouldn't have expected? I mean, obviously, loss is tough. In your line of work, it's like you you know it's going to happen. <laughs> it's it's sort of expected, but um, still has to be devastating. You know, I'm, I'm just curious if there are folks you can speak about who you admired and work with directly who you lost and just how you dealt with that. Yeah. Um, pr probably one of the more significant for me, uh, you know, like you said, you, you, there is sort of an expectation that, that um, when you're at war, particularly when you're at war for 20 years, that you're going to lose guys. Um, and some of them are going to be guys, you know, and some of them are going to be guys, you know, really well. Um, for me, you know, when, when guys would get injured or, or, or killed in combat and I was there, um, I, I think it sort of fits into that. Like you understand that, that that can happen. So it's awful and it's terrible, but, um, but you get it. Uh, I think the one that stuck out to me most was one that I wasn't there for. Um, I missed a combat rotation to go through some training in some schools, um, in, in early Oh five. Uh, and, uh, my, my best friend, a guy named Mike McNulty, um, and another unit member, another C squadron member, a guy named Bob Horrigan, which was a unit legend had been there forever. Those two guys were, were killed on the same target, um, on the same day. And then, and then in that same time period, another guy that was a new guy on my team, um, that was actually doing the job that I do because I wasn't there, a guy named Steve Langmack. Um, they were all killed in that same rotation in 2005 and, um, I didn't understand what survivor's remorse or survivor's guilt was when it all happened. Uh, it's taken me a lot of years and a lot of education and understanding to figure that out. Um, but the impact that, um, you know, the, the psychological effects of, of going, if I'd have been there, would it have been different? If I'd have been there, would it have been me? Um, that stuff uh, for me personally was, was way harder on me psychologically than, than when I was present. 
Um, it took me a lot of years to figure it out and a lot of years to get over it. Um, but yeah, my, Mike McNulty was probably for me personally, it was my biggest loss. Mike was a, was a great father, uh, had four children, um, was a guy that came out of the regular army like me. So he wasn't a green beret prior to becoming a Delta force operator. He wasn't an army ranger prior to becoming a Delta force operator. Um, so I knew how hard he worked to get there. Uh, and I just, I, you know, I love the guy, one of my best friends and it was a shame to lose him. Yeah, that's tough. Um, on the survivor's remorse, do you feel like now you're, um, I mean, obviously, you know, I can tell that like, you're, there is an emotional attachment to Mike and, and, and Bob and these guys, but like, do you feel like you're dealing with it better now? Just kind of with, with kind of your, um, I don't know what, I don't know what to call it training, but like you, you've sort of trained to be better at dealing with all of these traumas. Some of them are physical, some of them are mental, but um, maybe speak to that just kind of, how you yeah. reframe the way you think and deal with it. Yeah. So it, in my work with all secure and in my own individual work and, and re recovery efforts years later, you know, I've been out of the service for uh, coming up on, on 10 years soon. I've been out of service for a while. And, um, one of the things that, that I figured out and one of the things that we promoted all secure is like with, with post-traumatic stress, and we call it post-traumatic stress, not post-traumatic stress disorder. It's not a disorder. Um, another term that we like to use is PTS injury, PTSI. Um, it's just like anything else. It's, it's a, a mental and physiological effects on the body from trauma. Uh, and the recovery methods to get through and, and past and heal from trauma are just like anything else that you've done in your in your professional life. It's training and tools. It's understanding how to address it and ways to work through it so that you can reflect on it in a healthy light and it not have detrimental effects on your life day to day. Um, so for me, yeah, it was absolutely gotten easier over the years. Um, I compartmentalize things for a whole lot of years and, and I've since learned that that's not healthy. Um, you store those things up. I like to say you shove them all in a box in the back of your head. And that works when you're still deploying and you're, you're still going down range. It's a necessary evil. It's a survival tactic to, to box that stuff up and, and, you know, be as effective as you can be. But, but post-service, you know, I'm not in a life and death scenario every day. And, and I don't need to, to store all that stuff away for survival mode. Um, because what's going to happen is eventually that box overflows and it's going to come out in unhealthy forms when I don't want it to. Um, and so as time goes by, you have to train and practice and opening up that box and talking about those things and letting some of those demons out. And it does, it gets easier and easier and easier. What was your, I don't know if you had a bottom per se, but if, if maybe there was a couple, but what what sort of was the moment where you were at your lowest just from a, a mental standpoint and like what what caused that? Yeah, a combination of things. So 2010 for me, and it's probably weird for the audience. I'm very candid about this, but you have to understand it's all a part of my journey and I'm completely comfortable with talking about it. But in 2010, I almost took my own life. Um, it was a combination of the accumulation of trauma over a whole bunch of years in combat uh, and then leaving the organization that I had worked so hard and continuously strived so hard to, to remain a part of, I left that organization. And there's an identity crisis that occurs um, when you leave something of that caliber or when you retire out of the service, uh, it's all you've ever known. Um, and so there's an incredible amount of self-doubt that comes in about, can I be successful in anything else? Like this is all I was ever good at. What am I going to do now? Uh, and then those things coupled with, um, some injuries had left me with a prescription pain pill addiction that I struggled with for a couple years, um, and, and self-medicating with alcohol and other things to kind of keep those demons at bay, like we were speaking about earlier, but yeah, it all sort of culminated in a perfect storm to where, yeah, I, I, I was very, very close to taking my own life. Um, fortunately I did not. Um, I also had some folks around me that, talk some sense into me and got me to, to seek some professional help. It was the first time I ever 
had contact with a, with a psychiatrist or, a, you know, a doctor. Um, the next step after reaching out to someone was, was actually getting a diagnosis and, and having someone conduct some medical assessments of me and try to understand what I had going on and why I was feeling the things that I was feeling. Um, and that led to a post-traumatic stress diagnosis, a traumatic brain injury diagnosis, uh, along with depression, anxiety. Um, I was an insomniac for about five years. I just had all this stuff going on. And had I not really bottomed out like that, I, who knows how many years I would have toiled away feeling like I felt um, and being unproductive. Um, so I'm, I'm fortunate that, that I did sort of bottom out and that forced me to go seek some professional assistance and, and start that path to recovery. So, uh, well, on one of those notes, um, insomnia, um, I feel like a lot of people have this issue. Like what was there like a, a light bulb moment where you're like, Oh, this is how I fixed it. Like, how did you solve for that? Cause I, I just such an important, I mean, sleep is just so critical. Like if you want to perform at a high level, be it as an investor or as a, you know, a, a warrior, like you, you need to be able to sleep well. Um, how did you solve that problem? Yeah. First, first of all, lack of sleep is like chemical dependency. If you're addicted to drugs or alcohol or you're not sleeping, if you don't address those issues first, you can't address anything else that you have going on and you can't be at a hundred percent and successful addressing other issues until you deal with those. For me, sleep, um, I, how I got there, it, it was years of combat, messed up cycle, trauma. My brain just goes at a thousand miles an hour. It still does to this day. Um, and, and I struggled for, for years. How I fixed it is the simplest explanation you're ever going to hear. Uh, like right now I'm in copy up. Yeah. Uh, my wife and I are, are getting ready to go off on a mountaineering expedition to climb a mountain called Ojo del Salado, which is the tallest volcano in the world. Um, years ago. So when I retired in 2015, I was still an insomniac. I had gotten a lot better and it dealt with a lot of issues, but I still wasn't sleeping and my wife knew it. Um, and it created issues in, in, in my life. Uh, but when I was getting ready to retire, my wife said, what do you want to do? Like, what's something you want to do before you start whatever this next career is? And I said, I want to go on a real long distance hike. Like I want to, I've always been into the outdoors. I love the back country. I love mountaineering and climbing. Uh, I just, I just love being outside. And so she said, okay, well, we ended up settling on John Muir Trail. John Muir Trail runs from Yosemite National Park. It ends on the summit of Mount Whitney in California. Um, and it's about three weeks, about 220 some odd miles. We averaged about 10 miles a day. But what I found out on that hike is if you do something physically exhausting all day, and I'm going to use hiking as an example because that's what worked for me, but doing something physically demanded all day, when you finish at the end of the day, you eat a big meal, the sun goes down, you have nothing to do when you're on a long distance hike like that, except for go to sleep. So you are exhausted and you go to sleep. Well, when the sun comes up, you got to start your days early. The sun comes up, you get up when the sun comes up, you pack everything up, you get back on the trail, you do it again. When you spend consecutively, and I say it's about four days, but about four days out in the wilderness with no distraction, no cell phone, no computer, no other people talking to you except for maybe a significant other or partner or friend. Um, when you spend four plus days in the wilderness, going to bed when the sun goes down, getting up with the sun comes up, and then physically exhausting yourself throughout the day, it resets your circadian rhythm. Um, and so when I finished hiking John Muir after three weeks of being in the wilderness, we got home and the very first day my wife said to me, hey, let's go to the gym in the morning. I had gotten in a habit of working out in the evening. And she said, you've been waking up with the sun for the last three weeks. Let's go early, get that workout out of the way. And then, you know, kind of start our day from there. And we did. So three weeks in the wilderness, come back. Very next day, I got up at 530. I went to the gym, came home, healthy breakfast, healthy lunch, healthy dinner. Lo and behold, at bedtime, I was ready to go to bed, went to bed. I have not had a problem with insomnia since I retired and since I hiked John Muir Trail. And any time that my sleep cycle gets disrupted, travel will do it, things will do it. But if my wife and I go out and do a backcountry trip and spend three or four days out in the wilderness, you know, hiking and camping, um, it will immediately set me back to right. Um, and there's, you know, there's feeding things that help support it. You got to have a healthy routine. Exercise is important. Diet is important. 
But for the most part, spending time in the wilderness like that for more than four days without any distractions um, will reset your circadian rhythm and solve any sleep issues that you have. That is so interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it also sounds intuitive. Um, it kind of reminds me of like the closest I get is just skiing. <laughs> Usually I'm pretty spent after that. Um, yeah. So uh, I know we're running up on time. Um, so maybe, um, you know, I'll, I'll remind folks um, just really quickly on All Secure Foundation. Uh, started by Tom Satterley and his wife, um, Jen. Jen Satterley, right? Um, and their mission is to help guys like Chris, special forces veterans who've had, you know, recovery issues, leaving the service, or, or I'm assuming also even during service. Um, and uh, they've, they've done a fantastic job. So you know, I just would recommend anyone on this call or, or listening to this to check out All Secure. Um, we'll end with maybe a, on a light note, Chris, because I know you've got to fly off somewhere. Um, Delta Force versus SEAL Team 6, the great debate. Would love to know where you land. <laughs> Delta Force all the way. I'll tell you a brief story. I'll tell you. Yeah. So to go back to your Stan McChrystal question. So Stanley McChrystal early on in the Iraq war. So right after the invasion happened, McChrystal realized that he was going to be fighting a, a much larger war than anybody anticipated and that he was going to need to be able to move the chess pieces around however he could. Um, and his two tier one organizations were SEAL Team 6 and the Delta Force. And so McChrystal decided to force the two organizations to do an exchange where they would give us SEALs to deploy to Iraq with us, and we would give them our operators to deploy with Afghanistan with them. And the idea was cross-pollinization of resources and information. Um, it was to break down some of the barriers between the two. There's a lot of competitive nature over the years um, where, you know, we didn't necessarily see eye to eye and two different mission sets, but McChrystal needed to use us sort of interchangeably. So he forced the exchange, turned out to be an amazing idea. Um, I, I got to know and work with a lot of great SEALs early on those first few rotations in Iraq. But at the end of my very first rotation with that first group of Navy SEALs, a Navy SEAL team leader, we were sitting on the tarmac waiting to get on the bird to fly home. And he said, I spent the last decade plus as a Navy SEAL. I'm a team leader in SEAL Team 6. And I learned more in the last three months on a combat rotation with you guys than I have in my entire Navy career. <laughs> now I will caveat That's that awesome. so that I don't get beat up by the SEAL community. Like I said, a lot of good friends. Fast forward, fast forward a bunch of years and what McChrystal intended absolutely had its success. You ended up with two organizations that are better trained, incredibly capable, and honestly, two peas in a pod. You could take either one of those and I'm confident they can accomplish any task ever asked of them anywhere in the world. Um, so yeah, but that's my nod. So the unit all the way, Army <laughs> over. <laughs> yeah, but we, yeah, we did, we read, read between the lines. Did, I did. I did <laughs> want to say. I did want to say the All Secure Foundation, like you said, Tom and Jen Satterly started it. Um, they asked me to join All Secure about about a year ago. Um, I will tell you, we're the only organization that I'm aware of that focuses on post traumatic stress and secondary post traumatic stress. We're the only organization that I'm aware of that provides coaching, and we call it coaching, not therapy. Um, because as I said, we're going to provide training and tools to help you deal with whatever it is that you're going through. But we're the only organization I'm aware of that does that for the active duty person, the veteran and their spouses. Um, and that's significant because mm -hmm. what they deal with is is equal to, if not greater than what the veteran goes through from his own trauma. Um, and it's important that those get addressed. So, yeah, we provide coaching, counseling um resources training and tools uh to the veteran and the spouse for post-traumatic stress and trauma related injury well chris I, I can't thank you enough um i think it's i think it's amazing how you've sort of transitioned out of the military and obviously your story speaks for itself but um yeah happy to support the organization and and, and thanks again for taking the time obviously feel free to stay on the conference if you want to get some uh some portfolio picks but uh you know, thanks. Thanks so much for uh, for speaking with us. No, I appreciate you having me. Uh, I think it's really cool what you guys are doing. I am actually incredibly interested. And if I wasn't in Chile and leaving to go drive into the mountains right after this, I absolutely <laughs> would stay and listen to all the presentations. But uh, but yeah, but thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And um, have a good one.